Uh, thank you very much, uh, General, for that uh, kind introduction. And we are indeed delighted to be here and to uh, be a partner with the Reserve Officers uh, Association in conducting this conference. Uh, today, uh, as you know, is Lincoln's birthday, but it's also Darwin's birthday. And the best I can say about that is what Charles Francis Adams wrote around that time, uh, namely that the evolution of the American presidency from Washington to Buchanan should have given Mr. Darwin pause. <laughs> I want to begin by thanking a number of people who have been responsible for putting all of this uh, together. Uh, including the people in charge, to borrow the phrase used recently by General Jones, of the, uh, of the program itself. Uh, the Honorable John F. Lehman, Jr., who couldn't be, is not with us today. Uh, John Hillen, who is with us, he tells me that he's also an honorable. I'll accept that. <laughs> and, uh, of course, our executive director, uh, Michael Noonan, he's a captain in the reserve forces. But for today's purposes, we're going to promote him to general because he indeed is in charge uh, of putting all this uh, business together. Uh, I want to thank also, last and certainly not least, our trustees who have supported this. Uh, Bob Friedman, the chairman of the board, is here today. Uh, and those who were specifically involved with this, uh, Jack Templeton, Bruce Hooper, and W.W. W. Akeen Butcher. A uh, word about the Foreign Policy Research Institute. We are, as you know, a think tank located in Philadelphia, founded in 1955. And our purpose is to do education, publication, and scholarship in the field of foreign affairs and American foreign policy and security problems. Uh, and uh, we, our method is to bring the best of scholarship to bear on these issues with a view to enlightening ourselves and the public and perhaps even occasionally the policy maker. The origin of this particular program is that uh, around about 1996, we decided that we were going to start a special national sec security uh, program uh, because we were not convinced that the end of the Cold War meant the end of the use of military force. And we wanted to be able to monitor and to examine American ca military capabilities as the situation uh, evolved. Uh, we put together a book uh, eventually from that program that was called uh, America the Vulnerable. That book was published shortly after 9-11. Uh, everybody congratulated us on the speed with which we put it out. Truth is, it had been actually finished about seven or eight months earlier. Uh, and the fact that people actually thought it was relevant said to us that these were problems that were enduring and not necessarily the product of, of one event. Subsequently, we looked at the role of the reserves, uh, particularly a reserve system that was not intended to sustain the kind of long war that we were in, into. We looked at counterinsurgency, the British lessons that we were able to derive fairly early on. And then lastly, civil military, program, uh, civil military relations. Now, the origin of today's program, uh, which is titled Showstoppers, is our view that uh, now, after six or seven years of the war on terrorism, a lot of very important decisions would be coming up. And if these decisions were not made uh, at all or not made in the right way, we would encounter showstoppers, namely a, an involuntary reduction in our defense capability uh, because uh, things were not in order. And so we're delighted to have you all here today uh, to discuss this. I want to introduce the uh, moderator for the first panel, uh, Michael Horowitz. He's a professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. You have his biography there. He is often consulted, frequently published, and despite all that, not a bad fellow. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike, for the first panel. Thank you. So I'm uh, uh, honored to introduce our, our first panel. But uh, first, everyone, to reminder to please put your uh, cell phones on vibrate. And since the, this is being uh, webcast as well, if you're going to ask a question, which we'd encourage you to do, uh, please use one of the two uh, microphones uh, in the room. So I'd first I'd like to introduce our, uh, our speaker for the first panel. He's the uh, you know, noted author of the, the Sling and the Stone, 
He has a DPhil from Oxford and spent uh, 30 years in the Marine Corps doing uh, just about everything. So uh, TX Hams. Our uh, second, uh, then we have two uh, commentators. The first is a senior fellow at the, for defense policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Steve Biddle. And the second is a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, uh, Roger Carstens. So if you could all uh, come join me uh, up here. Let's uh, get this started. Good morning. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank FPRI and the Reserve Officers Association for hosting this event. Uh, I'm not sure I thank you for the topic, though. They've uh, given me 20 minutes to essentially restructure the entire U.S. Armed Forces after discussing the threat we face. So this will have to move along pretty quickly. <laughs> um, disclaimer, obviously from the lack of PowerPoint slides, I'm not from the Pentagon. Uh, so this is not the Department of Defense viewpoint. It is not the U.S. government. It is not IDA. By the end of this discussion, probably half of you will not agree with me. Um, <clears throat> what I was tasked to do was, was discuss how we will fight and that's a good topic. I was glad they didn't ask me why, because we have no national strategy. We have a series of goals with no ways or means assigned to them, so we have no real national strategy, so we really don't know why we're fighting. That's okay, we'll plunge ahead, because uh, <clears throat> a lack of a strategy has never been a reason not to fund the Pentagon. So we'll go ahead. The key questions I was asked was, what are the potential threats? What's most immediate, what's most dangerous? What approaches are we going to use against those threats? And how do we balance our investments against the threats and the approaches we need? In other words, we're, thank God, they asked me to go back to threat-based analysis rather than capabilities-based analysis. And uh, that has been a bad fantasy for about 10 years in DOD that I think we're abandoning finally and going to get back to threat-based instead of capabilities-based. <clears throat> assumptions, any good plan has to have assumptions. Some of the assumptions, we will remain engaged in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we will be committed, remain committed to globalization. We can't afford our current procurement plans. We're going to have to make some hard choices. And there will be no significant budget increases. Those are the assumptions I moved with. Now, you can agree or disagree with those, but so you know where I started the, the thought process from, I put those out there. So I want to look at three, uh, several kinds of threats, conventional conflicts, insurgency, terrorism, and then hybrid wars. Looking at conventional conflicts, we've got to discuss what enemies we might face. China is obvious, the one that uh, everybody wants to use as justification for more spending. <clears throat> it's interesting that one of the things we don't discuss about China is China has a GDP of $3.2 trillion. That is one and a half times that other threatening superpower, Italy. Now, while economy does not define your military capability, it certainly places limitations on it, particularly if you want to move to an air and sea operation. That's an expensive operation, expensive environments to operate in. Remember, $3.2 trillion. One and a half times the Italy, but the population of China is 22 times that of Italy. It is rapidly aging. China is facing an enormous crisis in aging. They're going to go from seven workers to one retired. In the next 30 years, they will go to two to one. So that's an enormous fall. They have no structure to deal with that. They have a water crisis slash environmental crisis. They are pumping the aquifers of the North China Plain dry, and they are making their rivers undrinkable. In fact, some of the rivers are so bad, they're not even useful for industrial use of water. They're facing that crisis. Their energy demand is growing at a phenomenal rate, and it's one of their key vulnerabilities. They have to import a tremendous amount of their energy. The other thing that we <clears throat> kind of forget about is they have enormous mutual interest with the United States. China is a nation state that desperately needs trade. For the government to retain its credibility, it must trade. So they've got the same vested interest as us. And oh yeah, something that rarely comes up in all of the scenarios you fight where you're going to fight China, rarely will we let them use nuclear weapons. Rarely will we even discuss <clears throat> the impact, the presence of hundreds of nuclear weapons, some with intercontinental range, 
have on how you're going to fight these people, if you're going to fight these people. So the conventional, <clears throat> what are we facing in China? Conventionally, I can't find a justification for a ground campaign in China. I do not see any place we can commit large numbers of ground forces to fight the Chinese. Therefore, it will primarily be an air and naval campaign. China has put a tremendous amount of effort on area denial in air and sea. Their goal is the second island chain. They're way behind goal. They thought they'd have second island chain done by 2010. They have not completed the first island chain capability yet, but they're, they're building to that. They're essentially looking at denial, <coughs> submarines, uh, very advanced torpedoes, uh, missiles to deny us the use of air bases well outside the range of our aircraft so that they'll have to tank one time inside the threat zone. And um, uh, finally, anti-ship ballistic missiles to make our carriers stand out at distances long past where the carrier aircraft can strike from. So they are studying a standoff air and naval campaign to deal with us. Russia, uh, after last year's uh, excursion into Georgia, there was a great deal of excitement. The bear is back, a lot of excitement. Uh, if you really look at Russia, they're 900 miles farther east than they were when they were the Soviet Union. Their population is decreasing by 900,000 people a year, short of major war or a biological catastrophe. Nobody's had that kind of a population collapse. They are facing enormous economic weakness. They are an extraction economy to a, to a large degree. Their government depends on it, and the prices have collapsed. And then in Georgia, the great Russian bear came out. They drove 60 miles. After preparing for three months, they drove a single division 60 to 90 miles inside against no opposition. This demonstrates all the power protection of Canada. So I don't see us preparing large forces to defend. Now, keep in mind, they still have nukes. So you've got to respect that and keep our nuclear force ready. And they have natural gas as a weapon against Europe, which is a different kind of problem. Iran is the next one, and Iran, frankly, is a genuine threat to the world oil supply. There's no question. They've demonstrated the capability to, to cut the Gulf. Uh, on the other hand, that's one of the few things that will unite the West. If you cut off the oil supply of the West, we'll get a lot of volunteers with navies to help us clear up that problem. It won't be easy. It will be hard, but we can get that done. They are WMD capable today. Any nation state is. If you look at the, the results of the Texas City ship explosion, you will see it's very easy to create a 20 kT, a nuclear equivalent, 20 kiloton blast out of an ammonium nitrate ship. Any nation state can certainly put those at sea and camouflage them as something else. So it is not that difficult to make a WMD. They will have nuclear weapons. Everybody you talk to says even if we strike, we can set them back two to three years at most, uh, provided we do very well on the strike. Of course, they've been dispersing their operation for years. And so even if it works and works perfectly, then three years later, you now have an angry nuclear-armed Iran. So I'm not sure the benefit's there. It's hard to envision a ground campaign in Iran. This is a country that is twice the size. If you want to stop their nuclear program, you've got to invade. It's a country that is twice the size of Iraq with three times the population. The terrain is much, much worse. They have a larger and already mobilized militia. So interesting problem. Again, it begins to look like Iran leads to a standoff air and naval campaign to assure the flow of oil through the Gulf and the defense of Gulf allies as both missile defense and point defense at some of the critical facilities that are sticking out into the Gulf. North Korea, um, we've been dealing with North Korea as the primary dangers of collapse for about the last 10 or 15 years or an eruption based on a collapsing government. Uh, they're capable of massive damage to northern uh, South Korea, including Seoul, with thousands of artillery pieces and thousands of tons of chemicals that have been assumed to be in their plans. That is a horrific effect. It will cause massive casualties, and there is virtually nothing we can do about it. They have dug into the hills. They put their artillery pieces under hardened uh, sites. We cannot do it. We cannot stop them in sufficient numbers to stop the attack. What we've been doing for the last 10 years is preparing to reinforce the North Koreans as they try to take the land back. So that's essentially our role there. So the key roles will be to secure nuclear weapons, reassure China that we're not getting froggy on the border, and to provide economic support. I do not see us sending large numbers of troops. This is essentially an occupation and pacification mission. So 
Language is important. The South Koreans have over 40 divisions, and every one of those guys has native level proficiency in Korean. So it might be a good idea to let them do that one and provide support to them. That's a quick run through on what the conventional threats are. Unconventional ins insurgency is going to be there. We're already involved in two, and, and they will continue, and others will also grow. We know what we have to do in the interagency. We're just not ready to do it. We are not ready to do the interagency response that's required, and that will take years to do. So DOD has to be prepared to do that. Um, hybrid wars, Frank put up a very, very useful term to make people understand that we're not talking about the low-end insurgency. Hybrid wars have been present for at least a couple hundred years. We can see them and identify them. Both of the Vietnam Wars, Afghanistan won, was there because we were providing the high-tech weapons at the end. Uh, the Brits in Spain mixed conventional and unconventional. The allies in Europe, both the Russians and uh, the, uh, the Western allies, used hybrid warfare. Not a new concept, but a very useful concept, because it's essential you understand you're fighting against a range of enemies, and you can't just go down to a bunch of guys who do pacification in villages. Terrorism is the other big problem. Uh, it's never going to be stamped out as long as there are people angry. They are going to, at some point, get lucky. Weapons of mass destruction are coming particularly biological. Biological weapons will be extraordinarily cheap and relatively easy to make within the next 15 years. We need serious research in that area. So that brings us finally, we've run through the threats fairly quickly, now we'll look at how to fight. China is clearly the dragon versus the whale. It's hard for either of us to get at the other. What we can do is stay around the perimeter, and that's why they're focused on this anti-access program. They're seeing a couple of things that are very interesting. They understand the danger and power of our precision weapons delivered by air. They do not think they can stop the individual aircraft, apparently, so what they're doing is going after the bases. They're figuring out ways to go out our, our facilities and also our carriers. So they're going to work on that. We're going to have to fight them in several domains. Again, I cannot think of a scenario that puts large U.S. ground forces on mainland China or anywhere that we would want to get in that fight with China. So air, sea, space, and cyberspace. So we have now a strategic choice we have to make. As we prepare, are we thinking in offensive terms? Are we taking the fight to China? A very uh, Western and uh, U.S. military concept if you push the fight into them. And that would be penetrating the denied areas. That would be uh, taking out facilities on mainland China. That would be going after their command and control. That would be going after their cyber networks things like that. You've got to ask a couple questions. Why? What do you get from that? And even more important, how do you do that without threatening the nukes or the National Command Authority, both of which will trigger possible nuclear war? And what do we have that's worth a nuclear war with China? We've got to be careful not to trigger the use it or lose it. And any attack on their C2, significant attack on their mainland C2 or their cyber even, will will bring concerns that we're trying to take out their nuclear capability. They do not have a reliable second strike capability. So we're in that rather delicate dance. That leaves us kind of with defense. And the key things in defense is to protect the allies, make sure that our alliances are solid, that we can protect them. And then an alternative is a distant blockade. China has a desperate need for raw materials to keep functioning. So if you're going to fight China, first you have to get past why we've decided the two nations have decided to fight when our economies are totally intertwined. But that happened. France and Germany did this in World War I. So that can happen. Then you've got to figure out how you fight that without triggering nuclear war. Uh, and I think that's very much a standoff air and sea campaign and it has enormous implications for the Navy and Air Force. How do we fight insurgents? This will remain the most likely conflict for the next two decades. The preferred method is always to enable the host government. That is decidedly the preferred method. The reality is, the reason they have an insurgency is the host government's incompetent. So you're trying to enable the incompetent. Okay, we should have some experience with that here in DC. But we've got to figure this out, and that means we're going to have to be prepared to fight at a certain level while we're training and advising. You have to do both in order to stabilize it and then extract yourself. The biggest military shortfall is advisors. 
While we pay a lot of lip service to the importance of advisors and we keep saying the most important thing we're doing is raising the Iraqi forces or the Afghan forces, if you track our promotion records, it's still not the best career path. We're still not serious about it. We still don't do serious schools. It's still short schools, short tours, people thrown together. We've got to get serious. The biggest shortfall is the whole of government approach. We have not done anything to incentivize the other agencies to participate in this. So that kind of gives a, a range. Hybrid war is going to be a balanced force between conventional and unconventional. You're going to have to do across the range, and that's why the balanced force. So what are our priorities? The number one priority for me remains nuclear deterrence. We've got to get that right. We've ignored that for a while, and we've got to fix that. We have to have an effective nuclear deterrence. No one may ever question that we have the capability to do this in a really big way and fast. We have to protect the global commons. If we really have an interest in globalization, we've got to protect the global commons, that sea, air, space, and cyberspace. We have to be able to deal with coin, not because we want to or because we think it's a good idea, but because it's going to be a continued problem as it threatens things that we need. Homeland security, and I'm not saying homeland security for DOD in terms of protecting against air or sea attack. What I'm talking about is response and recovery. There is a period after a massive attack where the local resources are exhausted and the commercial resources aren't there yet, and you need to have a federal response to that, and DOD is probably the only agency that can do that. We have to still be able to do force projection. There are going to be times and places in the world, which we cannot predict now, where we think we have to do something. We have to do missile defense, but that's more downrange. Develop it. Once we consistently can shoot down an inbound target that is deploying decoys, then we should start spending big bucks on deploying. But deploying missiles that can't intercept something to decoy seems like an odd use of money to me. And counter-terror. If we get out of the hunting terrorist approach around the world and start a different approach, then we can scale back on the resources. Not so much the dollars, but the enormous numbers of high quality people we pull out of the conventional forces in order to do that. It's the old tension between special forces, special operations forces, and conventional forces. You've got a limited pool of high quality people. Do you concentrate them in one place or do you season the whole force with them? So that what's, what I'm obviously leading to is a medium weight force. Balanced and medium weight. I'm not talking about something that focuses at the high end or something that focuses at the low end. You have to be able to fight state and non-state enemies. You have to fight terror, coin, hybrid, and conventional. And everybody says that's copping out. You're not making any decisions, but that's reality. I will guarantee you one thing from 4,000 years of human history. Prognosticators don't get it right. If you look at decade by decade who the Brits thought they were going to fight, they were consistently wrong. And that's been true throughout most of history. People consistently get it wrong unless you're bumped right up against a neighbor who is obviously there and an obvious enemy. So we're not going to get it right, so that means we have to go for balance. And I disagree that it can't be done. It can be done. The Marine Corps back before we got into Iraq and Afghanistan in a constant cycle, in a two-year cycle, um, anybody who's been in Marine Infantry knows you can train across the spectrum. Are you as good as the Army at high-intensity armored operations? No, you're not, but you're better than anybody else in the world. Are you as good at COIN as you could be? No, you're not, but you're good enough to buy time for the learning curve because that's the essence of war. War is a competitive learning curve. It's how fast you can adapt under stress. You are always wrong going in. You don't foresee everything that's going to happen, and the other guy starts adapting. Can you adapt faster? If you can't, you're probably going to lose. Although we are kind of the big St. Bernard fighting dog of the world. Not very good at anything, but we're so damn big you can bite on us for a long time before you have a lot of effect. And so that's our advantage. You get a lot of loose skin, you bite on us, you don't hit anything vital while we get ourselves organized. Okay, I've got to really go through this fast now. The Army. The current BCTs, two battalions, what we've done is we've added more headquarters, fewer fighting units, less flexibility. Obviously, I'm not a fan of the BCT program. We've got to go back to something that builds in the flexibility and increases the combat strength. Uh, balanced power, I would say line divisions like Marine Corps divisions, which are just a big toolbox. You don't have to deploy the whole division, you deploy the parts. The Navy, standoff and brown water. 
that's a tough mix. You've got to build a force that can go in close for the coin mission, but if you do have to fight at China, you're going to have to do it from a long distance. We've got to look hard at UCAVs. We've now got UCAVs that can be up for, I think it's, we're up to 36 hours or 48 hours. That gives you tremendous standoff capability, and then it's a big ocean. We've got to look hard at submarines and stay proficient at submarines, but particularly for fighting the air independent submarines. The Air Force has got to look harder at standoff and base hardening. You cannot assume your bases are invulnerable. We've been doing that for a long time. We have very few assets that are all vulnerable when they're parked on the ground. We get, keep the F-22s at the current level. That provides a nice insurance. We don't need to build a lot more. We've got to look at the F-35 as a UCAV F-35 mix. We've got to look at heavy bomber, and I think we've got to take a hard look at a UCAV heavy bomber. And then tankers air, and I, ISR. Air Force probably has the most challenging investment portfolio to manage. The Marine Corps is already balanced middleweight. We went from Desert Storm, fully up MAC, two MEC divisions, uh, down to coin operations fairly easy. It's a well-balanced force that moves back and forth. And the key is in how you train. Certain elements train heavily for high intensity. Your tankers are 70% high intensity. Your infantry about 60% coin, 40% high intensity. So you balance your training across. Guard and reserve, we've got to get back to being a strategic, not an operational reserve. We're straining them. It's an unfair use, and it's a bad use, I think, of guard and reserve. In addition to going back strategic, we've also got to give them primary response and recovery. We need a brigade per FEMA district, and it needs to be focused on response and recovery, not an additional duty. You can't do both, having run CBER, if I guarantee that. Joint requirement is advisors from strategic to tactical. We have to be looking hard at cyber. We have to look at how we're going to fight without the net. We're finally doing some analysis of that. We've got a real possibility of that, and we've got to work strategic communications. Finally, a hedge. Again, we will not get it right. Anybody who says they got it right is fantasizing. Warfare is, a, is innovation and learning under stress. It is a mental process that is done by how you select your people, how you educate your people more than how you train them. And we have been neglecting those areas badly. Our selection process is actively hostile to innovation. Our personnel system remains actively hostile to innovation. Bottom line, balance the force, plan for significant bu bu budget restrictions, and then hedge against surprise. I think that got me off in time. Thanks a lot for that uh, really interesting presentation. Now we want to have our, uh, our two uh, commentators. Uh, Steve Biddle and uh, Roger Carson uh, respond and give TX a chance to react, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, well, we, we were asked to respond to the paper, so I will cleverly disguise my own views and preferences under the veneer of a response to the paper. Uh, and given, to, to make that veneer at least superficially plausible, th there are actually a surprising number of points in the paper where I agree with, with TX. Uh, I, I was surprised and mildly disappointed that there wasn't more in it that, that I could uh, savage. Some of the more important points of agreement are, for instance, the, the way he treats hybrid warfare, which is an important issue and an issue where we have one of the foremost theoretical exponents of the notion of hybrid warfare here in the audience in the form of Frank Hoffman. Uh, I think it's important as a form of warfare, but it's also important to recognize that it's always been important as a form of warfare, that, that warfare is a continuous spectrum between rather uncommon extrema of conventional warfare conceptualized perhaps as the Maginot Line and extreme forms of guerrilla warfare conceptualized perhaps as the Viet Cong in the early 1960s. Almost everything is in between, therefore almost everything is hybrid. And one of the more interesting features of military history in the last couple of decades has been the degree to which state militaries in nominally conventional warfare have been adopting increasingly guerrilla modes of operation, greater levels of dispersion, higher emphasis on cover and concealment. So in addition to nominal guerrillas like Hezbollah moving towards forms of warfare we've traditionally associated with states, states have also been going the other way, creating an environment in which more and more non-state actors are able to adopt some of the more important features of the war making of states because states have been coming their way too. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, an important point. Uh, I'm very much in agreement with TX on that. Uh, 
I would also agree with TX that medium weight forces are in many ways a sensible response to the problem of hybrid warfare in relatively uh, intense forms of combat. The orthodox assumption that heavy armor is the right way to deal with conventional warfare I've never found terribly persuasive, especially in an environment where lethality has been going up and the vulnerability of even the heaviest forms of armor has been going up. The tendency in recent years to assume that the appropriate response to that problem is information technology and situation awareness, uh, I'm also a bit skeptical about because I tend to think uh, in a, if you will, hybrid form of warfare, the ubiquity of cover and concealment makes it possible for relative, reasonably skilled opponents to stay out of our information grid. If we can't find them, then we can't include them in a networked form of situation awareness, and therefore we can't rely on that. The traditional response to this has been hybrid warfare-ish tactics. Dispersion, cover, concealment, combined arms, fire and movement, the whole canon of the way great power militaries have operated increasingly since actually about 1917. Uh, in, in a last bit of uh, comedy and, and agreement, I would applaud TX's critique of capabilities-based planning and the tendency to think of US strategic and grand strategic problems in rather generic sorts of ways. I'm, I'm struck by the, the great divide in the US defense debate. There's tremendous attention and great amounts of time spent worrying about the particular details of the conduct of especially the war in Iraq. Then at the grand strategic level, the conversation sounds like it's you know, Rip Van Winkle from the 1990s in some respect. We talk about generic categories of future threat as though we weren't actually in a war. <laughs> as though this were peacetime looking forward into an ill-defined future against ill-defined enemies where we don't know where or against whom we'll be fighting or what kind of conflict it will be. In, in some ways, that, that nature of debate sounds a little bit like George C. Marshall in 1942 saying, yeah, 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 these, these Nazis and Imperial Japanese are all very well and good, but what we really ought to be doing is hedging against the Viet Cong. Somewhere out there in the 60s, in the future, there will be a different kind of opponent. I, I think wartime grand strategy and wartime theater strategy beneath that, normally speaking, is oriented at a specific enemy. Not even a specific category of enemies, but a real live, honest to goodness opponent in particular places and particular times that operate in particular ways and demand of us responses that can be actually quite expensive, quite sweeping, quite dramatic, and potentially relatively short term. Uh, and in that, and this is where I will finally depart from, from happiness and agreement and, and push TX a bit. Um, I would go a bit further in that direction than his paper does, actually. Uh, whereas TX, I think, quite properly acknowledges in a, a number of occasions that uh, we are going to be in Iraq and Afghanistan for a long time, much of the analysis nevertheless implicitly assumes that the real defense planning problem for the United States is the war to come after that. Hedging against future circumstances, the, the, the paper talks, for example, many times about her being in a strategic pause. Uh, and moreover, the, the prescription of medium weight forces that do a bit of everything and have balance is a prescription that in many ways is a better one for the war after than it is for the war right now. The, the opponents that we're fighting right now in Iraq and Afghanistan are relatively close to the guerrilla end of the spectrum. We are indeed engaged in coin uh, for which large-scale conventional operations are less appropriate. Uh, building a military that's balanced across the demands of an actual war that we're fighting right now and a future war against opponents who we can't yet identify is an unusual response to a wartime planning problem. Now, the, the future warfare debate in the United States, which is getting increasingly salient and increasingly important, tends, I think, by and large to be between people who argue that the future of warfare isn't conventional interstate conflict. It's low-intensity, counterinsurgency, uh, irregular and asymmetric wars, and that's also what we're doing right now, 
Therefore, we should transform much more specifically around the demands of this kind of warfare because there's no real cost in doing it. It's the future and it's the present. Why don't we just get with it and do it? It obviously must be you know, bureaucratic obstructionism by large reactionary institutions that can be the only possible explanation of our failure to transform in this way. The other side of the debate tends to be uh, no, 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 the future of warfare is not exclusively low intensity. There will be conventional opponents, whether China or whether hybrid opponents, uh, even in the form of non-state actors like, for instance, Hezbollah in 2006. And therefore, it would be a mistake to transform around the requirements of one kind of warfare, low intensity and counterinsurgency. And, and I tend to disagree with everyone, partly because it's, it's more fun that way, but partly because I think the reality of the situation is the future of warfare, looking out past Iraq and Afghanistan, really is more differentiated than the low-intensity transformation school often claims. The future of warfare is not exclusively asymmetric, irregular conflict. There really will be other opponents out there who will fight differently than that. The, the trouble is we're not waging that war right now. I think it, it's very important to, at, at risk of a, of a alliterative cliche, win the war you're in. If need be, at the cost of transforming in ways that leave us poorly adapted to the threats we will face after that. The consequences to U.S. national security interests of failure in Iraq and or in Afghanistan are very severe and very imminent, real, immediate, and demanding. If we don't do what's required, whatever is required, to avoid failure in these two conflicts, the American public will rightly be very upset with the way they've been served by their national security community at large. If that means that we have to transform with a larger Army and Marine Corps, with less uh, high technology modernization uh, with more emphasis on MPs and special forces and uh, infantry and less emphasis on armor and air defense. And it, th there's an entire agenda associated with this argument that we should transform for low intensity conflict. If we need to do that, which we may very well, in order to prevail in the wars that we are currently engaged in, that may be the right thing to do, even though I think it's poorly suited to the problems that come later, and we may just get stuck with a requirement for two transformations, which is not uncommon in military history for wartime great powers. We may have to transform once to win the wars that, for better or worse, ill-decided or well-decided, we are nonetheless now engaged in, and we may very well find that inconveniently enough, that doesn't suit us very well for other kinds of problems elsewhere that will increasingly face us after that. But if so, the response of the traditional great power has been do what you have to do now and then do what you have to do then. As inconvenient and expensive and unpleasant and awkward as that may prove to be. Uh, and with that, I'll stop. to say here or maybe not there's a computer up here can I put that down no I can't okay first off it's an honor to have uh, been invited here I want to thank uh, Michael for uh, giving me the invitation and FPRI for hosting this event and ROA for also hosting the venue as a retired uh, army officer it's uh, it's a true pleasure to be associated with anything that ROA does I also like to uh, tell you that it's very intimidating to speak before such a crowd I see people out there from the hill Senate Armed Services Committee right there, see people from industry, a lot of my military comrades. Uh, so between the Hill, think tanks and such, I have to admit I have a little fear and tre uh, trepidation and hopefully I'll uh, knock this out of the park. But I also have to keep in mind that really success in Washington, D.C. when you give a pitch like this is to somehow work whole of government into your conclusion. If I can somehow do that, I'll be okay. No PowerPoint. I think I'm going to get a passing grade no matter how bad this is. And yet I know that someone out there, no matter what I say at the end of it, is going to stand up and say something like, well, Roger, that was good, but when I left Afghanistan last week as a PRT commander, okay, you win, or the person who's going to say, you know, Roger, that, that was interesting, but in my book, Hybrid Warfare, okay, you win too. <laughs> and then Mark, and I'll look at Mark Jacobson back there from the Senate Armed Services Committee. He's going to likely stand up and say, huh, 
That reminds me of a funny story. I was having coffee with Ambassador Crocker and Jennifer Trace the other week, and they said, so I get the point that we're all brilliant. I invite you to throw slings and arrows at me when I'm done, but I've been given a mission to take a look at this essay and try to rip into it a little bit and then tell you what I think. The problem is I pretty much agree with everything in the essay. I read this thing four, five, six, maybe seven times, and as I made my notes, I just, came, I just had to kept, keep coming to the conclusion that I pretty much think everything that TX thinks. And I told him that last night, and it occurred to me, though, I didn't tell him this. I sandbagged him last night. I said, I agree with your essay, but I did find the one thing that I'm going to camp out on. In this excellent essay, and I'll kind of go down that uh, in a bit and tell you some of the things I agreed and found, excuse me, found. In this excellent essay, he goes on in great length to talk about what the future force should look like in terms of roles and missions. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, the Joint Force, but he left out my favorite topic, Special Operations Forces. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and let you know what I think about how soft can kind of contribute to this. Uh, I do that because I spent my youth in the 1st Ranger Battalion where I had a, where a mohawk and my vocabulary consisted of hua, roger that, make it happen. I had a very poor dating life back then. <laughs> then from there I went to Special Forces, grew my hair a little bit longer. Sadly my dating life didn't improve. I'm not really going to work on that. There's something wrong with me. I'll, I'll figure that out eventually. But nevertheless, I know soft to some extent. I'll never claim to be an expert. Uh, but I can tell you that my think tank, the Center for a New American Security, paid good money for me to fly around to Iraq, Afghanistan, Djibouti, talk uh, to the Navy SEALs out in California, the Marines, the Air Force, SOCOM. I've talked to a lot of people. I am not an expert. I won't claim to be, but I have a little information. I'll try to throw a few nuggets your way. I'm also going to camp out a little bit on the Joint Force. I think uh, there's been a lot of progress, especially in the last, uh, I'd say, year, on making the Joint Force, uh, I guess, a more capable force to fight the wars of the future. And I wouldn't mind just throwing a few nuggets in that direction, too. So again, thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, on the essay, and by the way, I'll throw one last piece of self-deprecating madness into this. Has anyone prepared for uh, a presentation just to have your, your printer die on you? OK, so we're going off on these little notes that I've scribbled here. And Dr. Mencken, I know I've used that excuse four or five times when I was at the Naval War College, so <laughs> he's, he's seen that before. OK, on the essay. I thought uh, TX did a great job of, of defining the fact that we have a strategic deficit. We have some problems. We're not addressing them correctly. We haven't done it for seven years. It does remind me of the Naval War College and the Peloponnesian Wars, where we got 27 years to kind of like try to figure this out and eventually come up with a winning strategy. You, you can't believe it's taken this long, but here we are. Seven, almost eight years into this fight, we're still trying to define what we're supposed to be doing with this. There are some, there's some great brain power being put into all of this. Uh, I particularly like the fact that you brought up the, the, the tension right now in the conventional military between preparing for counterinsurgency or preparing for conventional combat. How best do we argue about this tension? Uh, and it's uh, played out uh, in all the blogs, uh, Small Wars Journal, for example, or in the Warlord Loop. Uh, John Noggle, a desk mate of mine at CNS, talks about, a lot about the counterinsurgency advising fight. Lieutenant Colonel Gentile, I hope I pronounced his name wrong, never met him before, so I'm not sure there. He talks about preparing for the conventional fight. And TX rightly asks, how are we going to balance our forces? How are we going to balance our investments? And in chatting with him, I think he says, you know, you really do have to come up with this way of, of hitting the entire spectrum. And a few of my heroes, like Dave Maxwell, a colonel down at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, once responded to someone, and, that, and that's someone who said, you know, counterinsurgency is the PhD level of warfare. And Dave, a longtime Green Beret, said that's not true. The PhD level of warfare is full spectrum operations. You've got to be ready to do it all. You've got to be smart enough to have your infantry prepared to do a little counterinsurgency, your special forces be able to fill up some of the other gaps. You can't just sit there and camp out on, hey, I'm conventional and that's all I do. Wrong answer. We've learned that. We're getting better. And as TX rightfully writes in his paper, uh, our forces have truly adapted and migrated into that space. And that's a positive thing. Uh, I'm also a fan of Dan Kelly. You really, I'll throw that out because the Marine Corps is here. Dan Kelly's written about the, written about the same thing, Frank Hoffman. These people realize that complex operations, it truly is the PhD level of warfare, and I think we're starting to get that right. Um, Frank, excuse me, TX then goes on to write about the, his strategic assumptions, and, and pretty much I agree with all those too. I'm one of those guys who uh, would sit there when, uh, you know, Fox News or CNN would report that we were all nervous that, you know, Bush was going to attack Iran with conventional combat power, or we had a plan to attack North Korea. And I guess all the people in the military just looked at each other and said, no, that, 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 that's not going to happen. So the thought that we'd ever, uh, I guess, take conventional uh, forces into some of these areas uh, just always seemed like a straw man argument to me, kind of a, uh, a little strange thing to put out there. And TX rightfully addresses that and says, ground combat with those folks is just plain not going to happen. Uh, 
Uh, he camped out a little bit on his paper on the uh, 2006 war between is Israel and uh, Hezbollah, and I think rightfully so. And I think Frank uh, Hoffman does a good job of talking about that hybrid warfare, those threats of the future that we're going to uh, uh, have to be ready to, to address. And uh, I even say, I mean, that's everywhere. It's not even just in the places that we are thinking about going to war, but in the places that where we might be asked to uh, join the fight. And I was recently in the Congo. Has anyone been to the Congo recently? So I was recently in the Congo. <laughs> I had to do that. Yeah, but there are terrorist groups like in the Congo, the FDLR, and they're prepared to do a hybrid warfare as well. So it's out there. Our enemies adapt. They're almost like your kids playing with the internet. They're going to figure it out and they're going to be ready for us. And we really can't predict where we're going next. Okay, moving along since I got to move fast. He continues that we are going to see insurgencies and regular warfare in the future. And again, that's where I'm going to go to kind of camp out now just because that's what I know. I'm going to try to add a little value here. On the Joint Forces side, uh, we have a recent uh, publication of the Irregular Warfare Directive. And it came down from Secretary of Gates, who's pretty much said, Irregular Warfare is my number one priority right now. He put out a directive that's kind of that I would say is going to help Special Operations Command and the uh, GPF forces to kind of figure out what their roles and missions are, how they best address the unconventional fight that's before them. General Mattis is working hard down at Joint Forces Command to really try to figure out how the Joint Forces are going to bring their, their capabilities to bear. He has the Joint Regular Warfare Center that stood up not too long ago. I was at a conference just last week. I think I saw Rob Abbott and a few other guys down there. And the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and SOCOM are all there really trying to figure out what their roles are. So I think we're making progress. We still have some work to do. There's some good publications that are coming out in terms of directives, FMs, and everything else that is going to help the Joint Force and Special Operations Command figure out how to address these threats. Uh, but we have more to do. Here we go. We need a whole of government approach. Ding. Okay. Passing grade. Um, with that, we, I, I, when I was in the Pentagon, I used to have to work these whole of government approaches by trying to find money from DOD to throw to the Department of State so we can get SCRS up and running to build our civilian capability to address these unconventional threats. And I think we've made a lot of progress in that area, too. The personal security reform has recently come out with a report that it's worth checking out that talks about how we best bolster these whole, uh, our own government but to me, that also applies to how we bolster other host nation governments as well. You can't just throw the military in the fight. We all know that. I'm, I'm kind of like uh, preaching to the choir right now. But the joint forces, we're making progress. I think we're seeing some progress on the interagency front with the whole of government approach to helping our partners and nations. And now here's where I jump into special operations forces. I've, I've lost count how many times I've been in a meeting where a general officer is talking to a senator or congressman, and they come back and forth at each other and say, gosh, if only we had a force that understood counterinsurgency. If only we had a schoolhouse that tra and, I, and I'm always in the room. I'm not in a position to talk. Lieutenant Colonel Carson's. I'm not going to interrupt four-star General Schmedlap or Congressman, you know, up to camp. But I always wanted to sit there and say, you do. It's called Army Special Forces. They're at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They have a two-year program. Everyone speaks a language. All we do is study insurgencies. It's usually blown off, and I sit there going home frustrated and uh, have a beer, drink myself to sleep, and get ready for the next day. But you do. You have a really, a, a, I would say, a very capable force, not just in Army Special Forces, but in Special Operations Command that truly can help and uh, address some of these uh, uh, threats. Now, I think everyone in the Department of Defense knows this. I think everyone in the civilian community is kind of getting a hold of this. But I would be remiss and deny my Special Forces background if I didn't at least tell you that you do have a very good force out there that I think could truly add to the fight. And yet they are with their own challenges. The Special Operations Command was given uh, a lot of extra oomph, you could say, extra authorities, extra resources uh, by way of the 2006 QDR and by way of some good hard work from uh, the Pentagon and Congress. Unfortunately, we didn't always get it right. We gave ourselves 13,000 people, but we didn't quite get the enablers down. We're still low on helicopters. We're, we're low on uh, UAS, unmanned aerial systems. We're low on intelligence analysts. There are things that we need to make sure that we get this right. It's my hope that in 2010, the QDR will help us right sides that special forces growth that we received in 2006 that will help us to contribute to the fight. Uh, we also have challenges in, uh, within Special Operations Command determining whether we hit the direct action piece hard or the indirect approach. So even within the Special Operations community, we're having an internal dialogue and wondering how we do this better. Is it better to put forces on the ground to go kill people, or is it better to work by, with, and through other forces to enable our partners to go do the hard things that need to be done? To an extent, we're getting it right, but to an extent, we're not. Who read that great uh, story, a very emotional story about, f I think, 14 Green Berets from 3rd Special Forces Group 
who got in a horrific dust up in Afghanistan, out of which came numerous silver stars. They landed them in the middle of a uh, kind of like a little saddle of terrain with 30 Afghans, and they took a horrendous amount of fire and they fought their way out of it to great bravery. You know what my Green Beret buddies say to that? What were 14 Green Berets doing only partnered with 30 Afghans? A Special Forces ODA of 12 men should be leading a battalion. They should be with 450 Afghans, or 450 Iraqis, or 450 folks from pick your country. And instead, 14 Green Berets are linked up with 30 Afghans. Huge problem. You go to, you go to Afghanistan and ask whether you need more Special Forces there, they'll say flat out no. I need helicopters. I need relationships with my Afghan units. I need intelligence analysts. I need enablers. But the big thing is, partner me with an Afghan force. Don't put an entire Special Forces group worth, worth of ODAs and then just give me a few Afghans to partner with. That's not what the Green Berets do. Okay, I have so much more to say. I'm going to have to stop here. But I guess I would like to leave you with uh, just a few thoughts. And that is, the joint force is moving in the right direction. It's trending in the right area. General Mattis has got this for action. He's pushing people hard. And the services, as even evidenced by the people in this room that are, that are involved in those efforts, the services are moving in the right direction. Not there yet, trending right. It's going to get done. Secondly, your special forces units out there are also doing the right things. And they're working with the joint forces to make sure that we all get this right so we can approach these regular threats of the future. A superb essay, sir. I'm very honored that I had a chance to review it. Uh, I think he gets it right. And I would be happy to do one last part of special forces uh, waving the flag. Interesting uh, thing, you say we don't know how to fight. He's absolutely right. We don't know how to fight, or we don't know why, we, why we're fighting. And yet, Special Operations Command did produce a nice little video about the Special Forces way of addressing some of these threats. I brought a few with me. If you're interested, I'll be handing them out afterwards. But anyway, I look forward to your slings and arrows after, and I look forward to that one question where you make me look stupid. No. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to your, your questions. Thanks a lot, Roger. That was, uh, that was really terrific. Uh, TX, would you like to respond? Um, first, thanks for thoughtful comments on both parts. Um, Roger, they, I'm sorry you have to keep going with that lame printer excuse. It's too bad you can't afford a dog to eat your homework. Um, but maybe because he's away so much you can't keep a dog. I would agree with the, I'm not going to challenge your uh, knowledge in special forces because frankly I'm, I have not studied that as much as I should. The one thing that does concern me is I absolutely agree, special forces get it, understand it, have the professionalism to do it, but as a result of the Wally worldization of Special Operations Command, they often take these highly trained guys who could be leading 450 Afghans and instead have them clear a single room to find a high value target. A waste of assets. Essentially, you've taken an infantry squad task and assigned it to very highly trained special operators. I'd like to see us get away from that and get special forces back into being special forces. Um, on your joint forces, I would agree. Um, the one thing that I'm not convinced on, on on joint forces is we consume enormous resources in joint headquarters that I suspect if we did an analysis of email we would find about 90 percent of the emails are emails to ourselves essentially we become a self-licking ice cream cone uh, while you may disagree with the previous COCOM and CENTCOM uh, about his political statements cutting a thousand people out of the CENTCOM staff is probably a damn fine idea Problem is we started one layer too low. We needed to cut 1,000 out of the Pentagon because higher staffs always create paper for lower staffs with not much added value. Steve, um, first I appreciate you agreed with, with a number of things. Uh, I will disagree with you on when the war we're in. We absolutely have to win the war we're in. And the war we're in primarily is a ground forces war. I don't see us making any shifts in ground forces. We focus on winning. The problem is we're making we're faced with critical budget decisions on air and naval forces. And because the ground wars are sucking the oxygen out of the air, to a certain degree they should, we are going to continue building the forces that would be great if we could just get the Soviets to come back and meet us at high noon in the Sahara Desert. Barring that, we have made investment decisions that we're continuing to ride that are taking us in the wrong direction. And I think we've got to take this strategic pause. The strategic pause is primarily in the air and naval arena. We've got to take advantage of that pause. Absolutely, we've got to stay focused on the ground forces in the fight they're in. 
when we start to draw down and build a reserve, and this is where I'm going to a whole other conference on what we're doing in Afghanistan and what our goal is and what we think we're going to get out of it and what we're willing to pay for it. We need a conference on that. Fortunately, there seems to be some serious discussion on that. When we get out of these places and can rebuild a strategic reserve, we will need one mechanized core. We're going to need to retain that capability because we don't know if it will be used. I don't see that as an FCS. But this is where we have problems. We, we're going to spend a huge amount of money on the F-35. If we look at the strategic pause, we're going to build an airplane that will not possibly be used against that kind of an enemy for 15 years, so we'll match a 15-year-old airplane. Meanwhile, we'll consume all of our resources building it. We're going to build FCS if we ever figure out what it is and, and can get more than three or four of the systems to work. Our shipbuilding program is a shambles. The U.S. Navy has to figure out how to build a ship somewhere within, oh, say, 100 percent of the cost estimate. Uh, they build good ships, but we don't seem to be able to got a plan because we can't control the cost. And the EFV, the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle for the Marine Corps, here's a vehicle that was designed with the thought we would operate within 25 miles of the shore. I think Hezbollah showed us the fat ships aren't coming that close. So we're spending billions of dollars on a vehicle that will end up 50 miles short of the beach. Uh, we've got to rethink that process too. And that's why it's essential. We have to think about the next fight because we're making the spending decisions today and these are very long lead item uh, discussions. Uh, so it's got to, we're going to have to do both. Win the war we're in, and that's primarily now a ground forces problem, uh, although it's putting enormous strain on the air forces, um, and then figure out what we're going to do next. I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot. So we're going we're gonna to open, open it up for questions now. Just as a reminder, uh, since it's being uh, webcast, to please go and uh, ask your question from one of the two microphones uh, in the room. My name is Hank Simon. I think this is up. My name is Hank Simon, and uh, I enjoyed all of your comments, but I was surprised with the uh, implication uh, TX made that we're on the verge of going back to threat based planning. I have heard just the opposite from all my work here in Washington, especially with the appointment of Michelle Flournoy, who's one of the founders and proponents of capabilities-based planning. So I'd be interested in why you came up with that comment. No, I said that I was tasked to come up with threat-based planning. I have no idea if the Pentagon's going to agree and go that way. Um, there's some pretty harsh and I think pretty solid criticism of capabilities-based planning uh, because it kind of begins you build whatever you think you want. And if you don't compare it to a specific time and place, you have no idea if, if what you're building is capable. So I hope we'll eventually wander back to threat-based planning. Uh, it's messy, it's hard, uh, and you have to take some risk. But that's why you hedge and balance a bit. Uh, Mr. Hames, you, uh, you, start, you left off by saying we need to win the war we're in. How would you? define winning each of these wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, and to the extent that the other uh, panel members have differences, like to hear what your criteria are for the indications of winning this war. First off, I would say um, Iraq is by far the most important of the two conflicts. If there is a question of where your effort goes, it must go to Iraq. Um, winning is kind of continuing what we're doing now. It's a slowly evolving balance of conflict in uh, Iraq. We've pretty much taken the lethality out of it. They're now not going to agree. It'll be a long struggle. But as long as they keep the lid on it, that's good. I think we're about where we need. We need to keep reinforcing that. A lot of political effort to make sure that the conflicts don't become kinetic again. Afghanistan, and uh, this is where John Noggle and I have been going at it pretty hard. I think Afghanistan is the wrong question. It's really how do we stabilize that region. And Pakistan is the important nation, by far the most important nation. It, um, 170 million people, over 100 nuclear weapons, uh, tremendous toxicity if it starts to come apart. And frankly, there are enormous problems. You've seen the reports that they've lost control of SWAT in the northwest frontier. Now you're, now you're out of the federally 
administered tribal areas into Pakistan proper, so to speak, in SWAT, and they've lost control of it. The police have quit. So there's an enormous problem there. What we're doing in Afghanistan, because we have not prioritized, we are taking actions in Afghanistan that are destabilizing Pakistan. This makes no sense to me. We run bombing raids into Pakistan in order to save Afghanistan. We are trying to disrupt the drug trade heavily in Afghanistan, absolutely essential if we're going to do something in Afghanistan. But where is it going to go? Probably back across the border into Pakistan. We have to have a regional strategy. We have to prioritize. And I think that priority comes down in terms of Pakistan and not Afghanistan. And that requires a massive rethink, which fortunately we seem to be in the process of. There are a number of uh, rethinking projects going on. I don't have uh, access to any of them, but I certainly hope we're rethinking it to a regional solution. Maybe just to add a, a couple of bits to that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of using the phrase win the warrior in because it's, it rhymes. Uh, but I actually try as a rule to avoid the phrase win. I, I think what we have in both Iraq and Afghanistan is an array of rank orderable interests, some of which we have a decent chance of obtaining, others much less so. Whether you want to consider securing our two top interests in these two theaters as winning or not, I'll, I'll leave to others. But I think the two key interests in Iraq are the humanitarian interest of preventing mass violence in a war that we bear more than the usual degree of responsibility for. But, but secondly, and more narrowly strategically, preventing the war from spreading. Intense ethno-sectarian civil wars of the kind that Iraq had become by 2006 have a very serious tendency as an empirical matter to suck in their neighbors and spread. And in the Persian Gulf, chaos in that region in that way would be a disaster. So those, as TX points out, are very important central national strategic interests for the United States. In Afghanistan, we have very important interests, but they tend to be indirect. Uh, like TX, I tend to think that the, the key issue is Pakistan rather than Afghanistan. The problem is we have very little leverage over the Pakistanis. We're radioactive in Pakistan. We're not going to be deploying 140,000 U.S. troops to conduct counterinsurgency in the SWAT anytime soon. Most of our ability to do anything about the, the central strategic problem in the region and arguably the world in Pakistan is very, very indirect. I mean, trying to use carrots and sticks to persuade the Pakistanis to do more of what we would like and less of what they would like. And uh, we, we should be doing more of that. Our policy should be more conditional. We should be oriented more around trying to get them to change their behavior. I think the new administration will do that. That's all to the good. Those are relatively weak levers. Arguably, the most important effect we can have over outcomes in Pakistan is avoiding making things radically worse by allowing Afghanistan to collapse into a massive haven for insurgents that will destabilize Islamabad. And I think our, as a result, the, the best case you can make, in my view, for a serious war effort in Afghanistan is to prevent the collapse of the Karzai government and to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a force that can make substantially worse a situation across the border that we otherwise have very little ability to affect. Uh, I happen to think that both of those, the interest in not destabilizing the Persian Gulf as a result of failure in Iraq and the interest in not destabilizing Pakistan through failure in Afghanistan, are both rather important in, to U.S. interests, which, which creates this great conundrum then of, of how do you get the troops you need to deal with the Afghan problem without leaving Af Iraq denuded of what are now essentially peacekeeping forces, but which are nevertheless providing an essential role in preventing what amounts to a nearly nationwide ceasefire in Iraq from devolving back into warfare, as many such ceasefires do in the absence of peacekeepers. Uh, now, th this is, as TX suggested, a much bigger question, and mu much as I'd like to take up another 15 minutes, because I think it's an important matter. I won't do that unless invited by another question. Uh, th this is, though, to, to suggest that uh, we do have important interests that I think can reasonably be secured in both theaters, but there are limits on, on our ability, especially in Afghanistan, to affect the primary concern which is whether or not Pakistan collapses and becomes a, a nuclear terrorist haven in ways that would be a serious, serious threat. To an extent, I will not answer your question, but I'll at least come at it from that special operations perspective, if I may. In Iraq, 
Uh, one thing that has the special operations community very panicked about is that uh, they're afraid the conventional forces are going to go through a withdrawal and that they will be left behind to actually do those missions. Now, probably a, a justifiable fear, since during the uh, campaign that led up to uh, uh, our, our recent presidential change, uh, some folks on the Obama side uh, actually floated that up as a policy uh, prescription. <laughs> policy is probably too strong of words, more you know, a, a tactical operational thing. But they talked uh, about pulling the conventional forces out and that policing up the battlefield would be left to the special forces. What concerns those folks is that uh, they're going uh, to be left without logistical support, helicopter support. A lot of the crazy things that the conventional forces bring to bear are sometimes just making sure that the bases are managed, that the convoys are protected, that the fuel gets to the right places, that they have uh, helicopter lift, that they have fixed wing logistical support. So uh, on Iraq, I'd say, uh, I'll use that word trending. I think we're trending in the right direction. But when we decide to pull out, we really have to think uh, through the logistics side of the house to make sure that whoever we leave behind, we can support that uh, tooth to tail ratio and make sure that the, uh, the troops that we leave on the ground are supported. In Afghanistan, I think uh, TX uh, hit it uh, on the head. It's a regional problem. Uh, we have not really had a good strategy there. A common argument that we used to have at CNAS uh, uh, on Friday night was, you know, we, we don't have a regional solution, so why are we adding 30,000 troops? I can tell you from being on the ground, I sat down with a, a very high senior officer who worked on the black side of special operations, and I said, what do you think about that? And he says, I get it. I, we don't have a strategy. It's a strategy that should not only involve pa uh, Pakistan, but also India. They're kind of the hidden player in a lot of this, and we need that strategy that encompasses all of this. But he goes, what kills me is that you, you can't just wait to get a strategy and then start fighting. And he said a, a, just a, a great quote. He said, you know, Admiral Olson's fond of saying that you cannot kill your way to victory but you cannot have victory without a lot of killing. And he wanted those 30,000 troops to show up and he wanted to pursue the war as best possible while the people in Washington, D.C., to an extent, got their act together and provided those troops with what they deserve, a strategy. And uh, I think that's all I'll add to that question. I'd like to suggest we look at it a little differently. We keep saying that the best thing we can do for Pakistan is to beef up the force in Afghanistan we need to take a serious look whether that might, in fact, be destabilizing Pakistan and destroying our influence in Pakistan. Because what we're doing is we're going to Pakistan and saying, you know, you're the most important game in town. You're really important. So we're going to send 30,000 troops to Afghanistan. They're going to keep a four-star. They're going to draw 90 percent of the oxygen out of the discussion in America. And, oh, by the way, your ambassador is going to be a three-star. Now, General Eikenberry is a brilliant guy, but the Pakistani army's reaction to getting a three-star instead of a four-star, I suspect, won't be positive. We've got to think of how our actions in Afghanistan are impacting Pakistan. We're driving those drugs back across the border. We're driving some of those people back across the border. Would you rather have the toxicity in Afghanistan, or do you want it in Pakistan? Because we don't have the capability to do away with it without a hell of a lot more effort than I think we're willing to put into that, or perhaps should. Can I jump in real quick? Sure. Well, why not? I, um, I love disagreement. Well, it, it, it is a muted disagreement, but it is a disagreement. Moral hazard is a big, big problem in Pakistan. I mean, if, if the fundamental strategic reality of the situation in Pakistan is limited leverage, I mean, we, we can't act directly because we're not welcome, then the whole problem is how do you act directly by persuading the Pakistanis to do what you want them to do and persuading them that we will, held, we will do whatever we possibly can to support you because you are absolutely essential to our, to our existence as a nation creates enormous opportunities for them to do what they want instead of what we want and to abuse our assistance. So anything you do that creates a problem of moral hazard in Pakistan is obviously creating a problem for you. The response to moral hazard in Pakistan, it seems to me, however, is the standard response to moral hazard elsewhere. Make what you do conditional, A. And B, don't go out of your way to persuade the government that you're joined with the hip, you know, joined at the hip with them. The situation in Afghanistan strikes me as one of the weakest signals we send to them about their centrality. I am A. I, I doubt that Pakistan concludes that they can do whatever they want because we have 60,000 know, troops in Afghanistan. Uh, I, I think, by contrast, if we were to fail in Afghanistan, the problem we have now of driving insurgents across the border into Pakistan would be larger by orders of magnitude. I mean, the, it, it's one thing for uh, 
Taliban to move across the border into Pakistan, where they already have a substantial infrastructure because things are too hot for them in Afghanistan, if Afghanistan were a statewide haven with the economic resources such as it is of Afghanistan at their disposal, I, I think that problem would be much, much greater. So I, I think, it again, I agree that the focus is Pakistan, it's not Afghanistan. That the problem, though, is in an environment where your ability to do anything about your primary focus is so limited, allowing something to become potentially dramatically worse in Afghanistan is a mistake. Now, our positions on various issues in Afghanistan need to be more, con more conditional than they are now, too. Moral hazard applies to Hamid Karzai as well as it, per as it applies to Islamabad. But, but I think the new administration is very likely to emphasize conditionality and to treat both allies, Pakistan and Afghanistan, more coercively, frankly, than the last one did. I, I think that's a good thing. None of that suggests that uh, we should terminate the war effort in Afghanistan, perhaps, or, or in some other way disinvest from the effort. I'd like to be able to do that, but I'm afraid the cost would be greater than the benefit. We're going we're gonna to break in now with a question from one of our online viewers. OK, we have a question from General Charles Dunlap. First, he comments that the presentation by TX is one of the best presentations I've ever heard, in a while, I've heard in a while. He says, I understand your concern about the diversion of resources for hunting terrorists, but doesn't hunting, hunting them inflict psychological stress upon them in a way that can inject real friction into their efforts? In a way, isn't the mere fact that we are hunting them itself kind of a force multiplier? Also, do you think it is a productive way to deter non-state actors by focusing on external nation-state support that many experts believe is intrinsic to most successful insurgencies. Uh, on the first point, the manhunting effort. Probably the best manhunters in the world are the Israelis. For long periods, every single month, they will kill a senior Hamas leader, sometimes weekly, for 10 years. So if it's that effective, why isn't it changing the situation with Hamas? You can keep killing these guys, and it does degrade their ability, but it is not a solution. It is a holding action, and you may choose in Israel's position to, to use that as a holding action, but don't think it's a strategic solution of any kind. As far as the external source, um, that is a problem in Pakistan and Afghanistan because it's not an external source. The tribes span the border. They don't see themselves as external. I mean, just because your cousin is across the county line, if there's somebody going after his house, you don't feel like you're crossing the county line to get him or a state line to get him. It's your cousin. And so this is cousins helping cousins. Um, so I think this is another problem with thinking of Afghanistan. If we pull out Afghanistan provides a unitary space for them to operate from, it won't. It will have a northern alliance. There will still be Uzbeks, Tajiks, Zara. There will still be the divisions between the Pakhtun and the Pushtun. There will be internal Pakhtun and Pushtun divisions. We could play that, and you may have some moral questions about whether you do that or not, or whether you just make deals to say maintain stability in your area. There are options other than a unitary Afghan state. That's what the strategy has to decide whether we're going for the centralized unitary state or we're going for some plan that keeps Afghanistan down to a dull roar and cut, stops undercutting our efforts in Pakistan. I absolutely agree. We have extraordinarily limited options in Pakistan, and we're doing our very best to undercut those. Lieutenant, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel William Glasgow from the National Security uh, Space Office here in D.C. I wanted the panelists to elaborate a little bit more on their views on resource allocation in the space portfolio, which is more than a single digit uh, fraction, whether or not you're talking operational costs or acquisition costs. In terms of hard decisions to be made, whether or not it's the big ticket programs that you hear about in Space News and the other rags or um, some other more generic capabilities as an enabler. Frankly, I lack um, the expertise on the space programs to discuss them in detail, but I think what you got to do is consider the how to fight question. 
we assume we have these networks. The Chinese have showed us that they may not exist when we need them. So how do we create a resilient space? Is that big platforms that if you knock one out, it cripples us? Or is that a whole bunch of little ones and you keep popping them up there? And you take some limitations in your bandwidth and you learn to fight with less because that's what you can guarantee that you'll have. My concern is we're, we're building the Cadillac program where you have all these capabilities which can then be turned off immediately. And even back in the 80s, remember when we used to do our exercises, nobody would ever really turn off the radios. Everybody knew that our radio battalion, if they started jamming, could take us off the air, but nobody would ever run an exercise without radios. We need to start thinking that through. Harvey? Yes, yeah, so I have a question on the, on the how. Uh, we talked a bit about this hybrid warfare, but it seems to me that a question that arises, particularly when you're dealing with what I call the target and shield problem, you have a well-trained force that uses targets, one set of civilians as targets, and another set of civilians as shields. Well, how do you get at that? If you use firepower, you're going to kill a lot of civilians. If you use infantry, you negate some of your technical advantage. And I'm just wondering if the panelists might talk a little bit about this, because I think that that is uh, what has arisen certainly in the Middle East as the formula whereby our adversaries can defeat our military superiority. I think first you've got to have a strategic plan. I mean, whether you whack the people or you do your very best not to depends upon what you want to. Uh, I don't like end state. We have DOD planning does end states. End states are for structurally complex problems, not interactive. They're not for wicked problems. Wicked problems have no end state. So all we should be working for is Deviation around a steady state is what we're really looking for. So drop the end state out of planning and understand there is no end state. In this case, you've got to say, what do I want that deviation around steady state to be and how do I get there? The Israelis chose to go in. Um, they did very well on troop protection. They killed a fairly high number of Palestinians, nowhere near what they could have. But then you have to ask, what was the strategic accomplishment? They killed several hundred out of 10,000 uh, Hamas fighters and now they're out, and what's the strategic goal? It seems that they've strengthened Hamas in the West Bank, even as they may have weakened it in Gaza. So your tactics have to be, should be driven by a strategy. That's not the way we normally do it, frankly, but, but it should be. And so you can't really answer that question until you tell me, what do you want me to do? I think the military has to retain the capability of being able to do both, because we don't know what our civilian masters are going to ask us to do. So you've got to retain a capability to do both. The much harder role is sorting them and doing it without killing a lot of civilians. And that would be the one I would train to. The other one you can do with precision munitions. Thank you. Well, just a, a quick word on the, the collateral damage issue and, and civilian fatalities in general. And the, the, the particular aspect of it I want to address is, is the argument that um, we, we ought not to do for example, uh, aerial attack of deep targets because it causes collateral damage and thus undermines our strategic goals. Uh, that's sometimes used as an argument for land power instead. Uh, either one of these forms of combat, if taken to a decisive end, causes enormous potential dangers of collateral damage. I mean, ground forces in urban warfare cause arguably more collateral damage than air power at, at standoff does. Any form of warfare, especially against an opponent, as you suggest, that will increasingly use intermingling you know, strategically as a way of reducing their exposure to our firepower is going to cause significant collateral damage. We, we have a normative responsibility to minimize it where we can, but I think the more important normative responsibility is to make sure that if we're going to engage in an act of war that's going to kill both innocent and guilty people, we need to make sure that at the end of the day it accomplishes the strategic objectives of the undertaking. The, the critique, if you were going to make it, of uh, standoff air power, for instance, in this mission, it seems to me is less that it kills civilians and more that it kills civilians without purpose. Because at the end of the day, it's not being connected with a larger strategic objective such that the, the conflict can end. And the conflict can end in a way that, that doesn't cause it to recur later. Uh, so it, it seems to me that the, the, the primary objective has to be Design the strategy for this undertaking such you can have a reasonable degree of confidence that you will end the killing reasonably soon and to some purpose. And that may, ironically enough, 
from even a purely normative calculus indicate that higher levels of collateral damage in the near term might, in fact, be normatively preferable to lower levels in the nearer term if at the end of the day you, you end the fighting and the war sooner. I think if you're referring to Gaza, I think what made that uh, kind of problematic to evaluate on, on the strategic level is the fact that they had the election. Uh, it was, the election was right around the corner. There were, I think, a lot of domestic issues which uh, filtered into that uh, war and the decisions to attack as they did. Uh, what I, I think I would offer, and to, I guess to answer your question more directly, it might be a little more on the tactical side, but I've been very impressed with, at some of the technological uh, leaps we've made in, I guess, intercepting missiles, rockets, and such coming into your, your area. That's still very problematic when you're, you're talking about bursting a, a, say, rocket fired by an enemy force into, it, we'll just go ahead and say Israel. But, uh, and I think, I've, forgive me, I'm not an air defender, but they have CRAM and CWIZ, those, uh, those entities that can shoot these uh, rockets out of the air. They're getting better, better every year. On attacking the bad guys, I was very impressed by talking to a friend of mine from Human Rights Watch who was on the ground. Uh, they didn't let him get into Gaza, but he was able to evaluate all the data. And the conversation did not go the way that I thought it was going to go. I expected him to say, you know, those doggone Israelis, they did this, that, and the other. Instead, uh, he said, uh, he admired their efforts. He said a lot of their targeting, when you actually get down to the command centers and the Israelis say, this is the data that we had, this is why we hit this one target, uh, entirely defensible. He said you can actually justify uh, the collateral damage and justify the strikes based on the intelligence that, that they gathered from either infiltrations or by cell phone coverage, or rather a penetration. So uh, I think uh, technology is going to answer some of that, but I think it does get into what, what these gentlemen have been talking about. It's, you know, does the tactical or operational uh, assault warrant the strategic benefit? And again, with Israel, that's just so hard to uh, judge due to the election, I think. They're, we'll have to look at that probably in about another year or two and see if that made sense. Thank you. Uh, another question coming in from uh, an online viewer. Uh, Joe Sarami, a lecturer at the Bush School at Texas A&M University, asked the panelists if they have any additional thoughts about the threats of WMD armed terrorists in the near term. Yes, I think um, WMD is going to come from chemical or biological. If you look at the Bhopal incident in India, which is now almost 30 years ago, uh, they killed 15,000 people overnight and there's 100,000 long-term injured because a chemical plant leaked. If you work your way inside a chemical plant with some basic knowledge of the plant, you may be able to recreate that or you could do it with explosives. Um, the other one that's of great concern is the Texas City ship explosion. If you'll Google that, uh, two ships were tied up. They had about 3,200 tons of ammonium nitrate, so it's a 3.2 kiloton blast. The pictures look a lot like Ground Zero at Hiroshima. Uh, we now carry ammonium nitrate in ships with 20,000 tons, so that would be a 20 kT blast. Uh, if I were doing this, that would be the way I would go at it. Uh, trying to actually get a nuke would assume that you could make the damn thing go off, uh, given I have trouble with a cell phone. I don't think I'd be the guy to, to capture a nuke and make it actually work. All right, well then, uh, I'll jump in and ask a question. Uh, one thing that I think is, is, was really interesting in, in all of your comments, um, and in particular sort of TX and, and Steve and some of the, the focus on, um, I'll ask the air power question. If, uh, if we are in a strategic pause, in thinking about uh, air and air and naval forces, how should we then invest in the future of, of air power? I mean, everybody, you know, the F-22 has sort of become pretty, you know, a, a sort of a whipping boy a bit, but what, what, what should we be doing to ensure air superiority in the long run at a reasonable cost? Well, again, this is where I say we stop with the F-22s we bought now. I guess we got 183, and we bought early purchase for four more. I think that's a sufficient hedge against the potential surprise. Then we've got to take a hard look at the F-35 and try to project a timeline on where we would need 1,500 of these critters. Um, I don't see it happening in the next 15 years, so maybe we tone that down, go to very low-rate production. As we look very, very hard... There's enormous potential in these UCAVs, the unmanned uh, combat aerial vehicles. Uh, as I said, they put one up that I think has been up for 48 hours. Uh, that gives you standoff. If the Chinese are going to be able to keep you 1,000 miles off their coast and your strike fighters have a range of 800 miles, you can kill some fish off China. 
So you're going to have to have something that allows you to strike from 1,500 or 2,000 miles, and you can hide in the big ocean. That's going to require some kind of an unmanned capability. So we've got to start looking at that. How do you get that unmanned capability? And then, of course, how do you keep it flying when they start taking down satellites and things like that? A lot of our capability now apparently depends on satellite links. We know satellites are vulnerable. So we've got to think through an entire process of a great deal of standoff in air power. Uh, the way to defeat our high technology air power is to go after our airfields. Uh, and I think they can, they're getting better and better at that. The Chinese have made an enormous effort to get good at that. And so we have got to think in those terms. Rather than thinking of air to air capability, uh, I think I'm, as a Chinese or as a, an enemy force, I'm going to pretty much cede that to you and I'm going to figure out how to take out your airfield, your fuel supplies, things like that, take down your network, something that, that makes the airplane largely irrelevant. Well, I, on, on these kinds of issues, I, I think TXN and I, although we differ in lots of ways, differ probably less on how to go about hedging, if you're going to do it, than on whether to go about hedging and to what degree. Uh, I, I think the issue at the moment is we have very, very serious opportunity costs on resources between hedging for the future and risking failure in the near term. And given that, my instinct is hedge less than we would have, for example, in 1995 or 1999. Uh, and as a result, emphasize the near term to a greater degree than would normally make sense because of the unusual circumstances of being at war. And when you, where you do hedge, it, it seems to me, it makes sense to put relatively more of, of the hedging caloric expenditure that you eventually decide is optimal into thinking rather than buying stuff. So R&D, and uh, prototyping, field testing. Uh, if, if you decide that to keep the relevant industrial base alive, you need some degree of, of uh, manufacturing, small numbers are better than large numbers. But if you conceive of this less as a need to deploy a force in the short term, that can you know, penetrate double-digit SAMs in X density uh, around the Taiwan Straits or you know, Iranian nuclear facilities, take your pick. And more, I want to make sure that if I eventually decide that China has made a decision to become a peer competitor and is emerging, I want to be intellectually and technologically equipped to respond as fast as they can when that happens at some future date. I think that changes the way you would go about it at the margin, especially if, as I'm advocating, you're allocating less aggregate resources to the hedging undertaking than you would normally anyway. Uh, I, I think my, my instinct about the way to do the hedging isn't so different from TX, except that perhaps I would keep relatively more of it on paper and relatively less of it in sheet metal. Um, Go ahead. Uh, is this on? Hi, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, sorry, Colonel Mike Page uh, from the Royal Marines, uh, working in the British Embassy here in Washington, D.C. First of all, I'd say, Roger, that um, uh, the Congo isn't our fault. That, you can blame that on the Belgians. Um, <laughs> I, I'd just follow on from what, what, what Stephen said, and, I, and I, I was fascinated about the, the, the comment about would Marshall be thinking about the Viet Cong? Uh, and I wonder whether Westmoreland would have been thinking about the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and I think we're in a mindset where we still haven't got over that the Cold War has ended. So whatever less than um, existential war we may be, be in today, there's the existential threat out to the future. And, uh, and the point about investing in R&D, I wonder whether perhaps you're uh, in an arms race where everybody else has stopped running. Um, uh, it's, the, it's the birthday of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I don't know whether the U.S. Navy had a, uh, an underwater capability development program back in the uh, 1830s and 40s, but you finished the Civil War with a submarine and a monitor. I know that we didn't have a protected mobility capability program costing millions of pounds in the 1890s, but we finished the First World War with a tank and a fighter aircraft uh, 
and we came out of the Second World War with the atomic bomb and the capability to put a man on the moon through uh, the ballistic missiles. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right um, that uh, we, are, we are spending far too much in, in looking and investing in, the, in equipments for future wars that we sometimes never even use and not enough in, in R&D and the science base and perhaps also on the anniversary of Darwin. It's, it's appropriate to, to uh, think about that, that pure and applied science and research is, is really where we should be investing in. And, and coming back to the debate on Afghanistan and Pakistan and what leverage they have there, uh, the existential threat to Pakistan is, of course, India. And the U.S. might consider its policies towards India and why it's interested in India, and has that got anything to do with China? Um, and again, think about uh, if the Pakistanis were less worried about what the United States was doing with India because the United States is worried about a fantasy about China, uh, then the Pakistani army might be moving in the right direction now towards the tribal areas rather than sitting on the Indian Kashmir border. Uh, just some thoughts you might want to think about. Okay, a, a couple things. First off, on the R&D, uh, that's why I kept stressing rapid adaptation under pressure. And that comes from having a good R&D base, which is why as we build down from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, depending upon the level of success, we build a, rebuild a strategic reserve. But I'm talking out of existing systems. I'm not talking about building something new. We keep a, an aircraft base alive simply because you need an industrial base. The reason we could do that rapidly in World War II is we were making lots and lots of civilian airplanes and things that were very similar. There's a lot of dissimilarities now, and the skills aren't the same as I understand it. The one area we, we desperately need more research in is biology. Uh, terrorist groups are going to have access to th synthetic biology, biological weapons within 10 years. They will be able to create smallpox in a lab. Um, and that does not necessarily mean jihadists. It could be uh, environmentalists. If you think the problem in the world is too many people, smallpox can help you with that. Um, so we've got to start doing real research in how do we rapidly adjust to pathogens that have been released in the environment. And there's a huge bonus on that because Mother Nature's coming back anyhow and she's a little cranky, so we're going to see one of these soon. Uh, we've got to do that on R&D. Your point on India, I don't see India as being a huge part of the fantasy with China, what I do see is that has to be a central part of our discussion on Pakistan. Because Pakistan, as long as they're convinced India is a threat, is not going to focus on sorting out their own house. There are also enormous internal tensions. Frankly, the Pakistani army or Pakistani armed forces have a very good thing going the way they got it now, with the draw they have on the resources of the nation. They don't really want to change that much. So we're going to have to work very hard, but the solution does lie in Pakistan or in, in India-Pak relationships. And that's why I find it very peculiar, all our emphasis on Afghanistan, which is poisoning those two relationships. It just makes no sense to me. We've got to make it an integrated strategy across the region, really think through what we're doing, and get our emphasis right. Concur on everything you said about India. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. That's, uh, I think you really cannot address Afghanistan and Pakistan unless you factor that in at some deep level. Uh, on the, uh, I guess, adapting, uh, we t always talk when it comes to adaptation during warfare and preparation in terms of equipment. And uh, I would like to see more done on just the human dimension. You know, I know, in, uh, again, forgive me, I'm always bringing up the special operations side of the house, but we spend a lot of time and money with PhDs looking at individual human beings and their ability to adapt. We put them through exercises that are not training exercises, but experiment, uh, experiential exercises where you bump into problems with no training on how to solve them, and then we evaluate the person's ability to react. Based on how they react on a scale, you then start giving them extra tools. And what I'd like to see is when a commander shows up in a, in a certain area and everything goes wrong, the helicopters don't come in because he, they, they've been weathered in, you're losing troops, you're losing ammo, the, and the enemy's about to attack, I want to see that adaptive leader who doesn't panic and go straight back to the military decision-making process because sometimes the answer's not found there. And when he becomes a general officer, I want him to see him take that same adaptive nature and thinking about how to solve problems and apply that to the budgetary process, the personnel process. So I, I definitely get, the under, uh, get that we are always are going to try to adapt equipment. Uh, 
and uh, big programs to solve the problem. I'd sure like to see us spend a lot more time training our NCOs and officers how to face problems that they've never experienced before and maybe look for the unconventional approach to, to figuring out how to get the job done. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for uh, coming today. We actually need to, uh, to, cut, to cut it off since um, uh, Professor Biddle has to go uh, give a slightly different spiel to a group of people over on the Hill. So uh, join me in thanking our, uh, our panelists for their uh, wonderful presentations. <laughs>